What's up, guys? Welcome back. This is episode 13, The of Baker's Kiss Dozen. Ascendancy. Ah, good job. Thank you. Today, we're jumping into basically the namesake. Yeah. Um, so, it's one of those things that you kind of you want to do, but you put it off because the task is so grand. Yeah, we have, you know, just other things that needed to be talked about. Yeah. Um, like hats. We had to talk about it. Yeah. But today... And we were on time, I would like to say, because Star Wars themselves, Talked via about Twitter the and all that Star stuff, Wars. put out a whole article about the best hats in Star yeah. Wars. So somebody in Star Wars is not giving us You're watching. the credit. You're watching. We know. You're one of the 12. We're on to you. <laughs> uh, so today, we're jumping into Grand Admiral Thrawn. Grand Admiral Thrawn. And who he is, his backstory... Where is he now? And then we're going to do... Uh, the idea was you have the Legends content, mm -hmm. which you, you can't not do some Legends content when it comes to Thrawn. Right. He is Legends. Yeah. He's the reason that it exists, yeah, really. He's, he's pretty much the only reason that there was any fight to fight, you know, after yeah. Jedi. Yep. And so um, he was really the, the ship that brought us back to sea mm -hmm. when it came to Star Wars back in the 90s. Um, but what we wanted to do was really focus heavily on the canon story that we have right now. And then when there are parallels that are significant or different or mm -hmm. so similar or whatever, yeah. we'll unpack that as well. Mercy. So welcome to the Thrawn episode. Thrawn Strav... I'm trying to think of a way to say extravaganza and Thrawn in one word. Thrawn Stravaganza? That's a little too... Thrawn Stravaganza. <laughs> Thrawn's Kalenberg. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Let's do it. Just go ahead and jump in. Uh, so Thrawn, why? Let's just do a little, a little love. Why is Thrawn so high on your list? Thrawn's special to me because <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not gonna go that whole trail. We watched uh, an amazing Star Wars book review this morning. I'm not gonna give the guy a shout out, but it was pretty good. You know, Droid to come through the best. You think there'll be Droid to come through the new movies? I don't know. It'll be sick. <laughs> Hey, go ahead. Sorry. Anyway, uh, Thrawn. Why do we like him? I think he's just. He and just. When did you? When did you find out about Thrawn? What was your yeah. your journey? That would have been, let's see, probably my sophomore year of college. I really got into Star Wars books. Um, I was reading a bunch, obviously for academic purposes, but you know I had always enjoyed reading right. for leisure, and so I was like, you know, we got to balance this out because I'm starting to hate reading. Right. Um, and it started with uh, a collection of graphic novels. I would have a piece of pie, and I would read a comic. Um, and that just kind of oh, got what me... what comic was that? Oh, that would have been the Quinlan Voss omnibus that you got ah, me for my birthday that year. Great gift, I might say. Uh, but anyway, so that just kind of you know got my feet wet, and then I yeah. read Plagueis, and then I think later on I got into the Bane trilogy, which is obviously very impactful. But you know, I wanted to read the things that go on after... Uh, six because this was before episode seven ever launched. So it's right. like, you know, where is it gonna go? We're talking like twenty thirteen maybe. Yeah, and this was before Thrawn was in Rebels. Rebels either, so we didn't know that they had moved his timeline chronologically. Um and I just I always kind of appreciated that Sherlock Holmesy kind of character because especially in Star Wars, because there's the idea of you know, kind of a force that you have to sense. Mm -hmm. A lot of the decisions are feelings led. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? You sense it or you feel like it's the right thing to do. Right. And he was just an oasis in the sea of emotion with cool logic. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just always thought that that was very cool. He was kind of like a Moriarty character um, from Sherlock Holmes, if you don't know. And I just really thought that he was he was the cool villain that you wanted to root for because he's the type of villain, which is my favorite type, which is the one that who believes 
they're actually in the right. Right. Uh, that he believes he's actually Because you can really doing... root for that character. Exactly. That's what makes Anakin's fall to the dark side. He's such a lovable character, and mm-hmm. then it's so heartbreaking, Anakin's fall versus... Yeah. You know, nobody nobody ever was like, oh, Sheev, like, right. you know. Palpatine's just Palpatine. He's yeah. just bad. But with Anakin, you see the turmoil, you see the struggle, mm-hmm. you, you see his desire to do what's right, and in Revenge of the Sith, like, he's crying while he's, like, axing these kids. Right. Uh, but he's doing it because he thinks it's ultimately the greater good. Yeah. And so, uh, Thrawn is definitely yeah. that character. Very he's... similar to uh, what we talked about in the Rise of Kylo Ren comic as well. You know, just mm-hmm. very drastic, you know, and, and painstaking transformation. Yeah. But, you know, in the midst of all of that, there's this one character who is not only removed from that, but he's actually, like, weaponizing it. Yeah. Where he's using their emotions and their tendencies against them. Yep. Um, and I just thought that it was very cool, especially um, for somebody who's non-human to be able to take yeah. up the torch of the Imperial regime. That's a huge, huge deal. Well, the deal. thing is that the the Imperials, they're, mm-hmm. they're very much a, you know, a type or a shadow of the mm-hmm. Nazi regime. Right. Where there's this one type of person that we want to rule. And so obviously for, for the Nazis in Germany back in the, in the 30s and 40s, you had the Aryan right. you know, type, which was a white person that had blonde hair and blue eyes. That was like the perfect human being to a Nazi, mm-hmm. which is crazy because Hitler was, Hitler was like not one for German. <laughs> he was Austrian. Brown hair and I don't know what color Brown eyes. Brown eyes, I think. Yeah. So anyway, uh, he's like, what's up? I do what I want, you know? But so you have uh, the... In Star Wars, instead of it being just a, a white human or whatever, it was just right. humans in general. Human beings. And so you have Thrawn, who's so brilliant mm-hmm. that he's able to rise above yeah. get that and, and be handpicked by Palpatine, right. by Vader. Well, and not so much in uh, the newer uh, versions of Thrawn's story, but in the older ones especially, I think there was only like 24 Grand Admirals in the mm-hmm. whole Imperial Navy. Yeah, there might have been even less than that, maybe. And he was the only non-human. He was the first non-human, and he was the only non-human the entire reign right. of the Empire. Well, and you see um, the high command makes a lot of decisions. That's like a lot of the moths and the high-ranking officials. But you can only get the Grand Admiral promotion from Sheev himself, from the Emperor himself. He picks every single one of them. Yep. Which means you have to have an outstanding record, because as unforgiving as Darth Vader is, we see an Empire, the Emperor is even less forgiving. Yeah. Uh, you gotta have no mistakes, you know, and at the same time to meet all of those and still be non-human and still be the best even in this very elite circle, phenomenal. Yeah. I really like the fact that you were doing like comics with a slice of pie and then you were like, ah, this is nice. I think I'll go into the middle of the ocean with Darth Plagueis <laughs> and the Darth Bane trilogy. I just heard so many good things. Yeah. You know? No, those are good. Those not. are good ways to start. Um, I had always kind of heard about Thrawn and I had seen pictures of him growing up and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, growing up in the 90s, of course, uh, but I didn't know what the deal was. I remember seeing, you know, the uh, the Salamiri, whatever, mm-hmm. around his shoulder and being like, that's a yucky bug. Like a, a giant, like, slug-looking dog. Turns out it's a weasel sloth. <laughs> it's negative force. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, my, actually, my first time to, to jump into uh, Thrawn's story was I was walking through our local mall and... Uh, of course, everybody in the world, if there's a Barnes & Noble, that's where you park. And so you're walking through, and uh, I would always check the Star Wars section. I would always check the Red Wall book section, R.I.P. Brian Jakes. And I would always check the, th- the Star Wars section, which were comics and whatever. Very close together. Yeah, they're right Barnes there. And, and so I'm walking by, and when there's a new book or a book they want you to see, they've mm-hmm. got the little shelves on the end of the, the book end, basically, mm-hmm. and they've got their stuff there. And I saw this shimmery silver book. And I was like, what is that? And I believe it was 2011 uh, because it was the 20th year anniversary of Heir to the Empire. Okay. So Heir to the Empire came back in 1991, uh, two years prior to my birth, four years prior to yours. And um, You want to give up my social security number while we're here? <laughs> <laughs> Who's really behind this? Mm-hmm. Scuba Doo reveal. Um, so, gross meddling kids. Uh, so... I remember thinking, oh, this is really cool. So I bought the book, and I didn't read it for years. And that's not like me. Usually I buy a book and I just read it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had I bought the book, and I looked up. And I was like, oh, it's 20-year anniversary. So this is not new. This is like, you know, whatever. So I'm looking it up in the store. 
um, probably on my like iPhone 3G or something. When the freaking... Now with internet. <laughs> yeah. When you're like... You can actually pick your background on this one. <laughs> Want to send a picture? Too bad. Uh, so Better download our mail app. So I, uh, I was looking at it and much like us wanting to do this episode so badly, but having to get to it eventually, uh, that book stayed on my shelf for I don't know how long because I was intimidated of reading that book. Uh, and not because it was too long or anything, but because I had heard so many good things, I was scared I wasn't going to like it. Mm. You know, it was kind of like, I didn't, I didn't watch Game of Thrones as it was coming out until the last like season or two. You know, I didn't watch Breaking Bad as it was coming out until, you know, the very last season. Uh, I didn't watch Avatar Last Airbender when it was coming out. I didn't watch, so all these things that are really critically acclaimed. You were acclaimed. that you were going to be token in a sea of Black Panther fans. Yes. The Deep South Park cut. Yes. <laughs> uh... I was afraid it was going to be okay, yeah. which Black Panther was. Uh, so, now anyways, done it. <laughs> whatever gets us more views, even negative attention is attention. Uh, but, anyways, uh, so I finally read it, and I remember immediately, you know, like you said, around 2012, 2013, you were really getting into Star Wars books. Um, and I remember getting you that Quinlan Boss comic, and then, you know, it would be. You know, now we're at a place where you're telling me, oh, this book's coming out. And we're, like, pre-ordering it and stuff mm-hmm. together. But at that time, I was like, yes, now eat this. Yes, now this. They're like, ooh, be scandy. Ooh, be scandy. And uh, so, Plagueis and the Bane Trilogy and all those things. Yeah. And then I was like, Well, they were all so good, I was reading them in, like, three or four days. Yeah, I was like, you've got to read the Thrawn Trilogy. You've got to read it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I ended up reading Heir to the Empire in, like, a day. It was just so good. I freaking loved it. Thrawn's character... Uh, now when I go on Audible and I reread or re-listen to books, you know, especially the first Thrawn book that the the new canon with Arinda Price, I'm like skip, skip. I'm just going to the Thrawn chapters. I told Josiah I was listening to the Thrawn book, maybe like for the third or fourth time, mm-hmm. and I was like, yeah, I'm just here for Thrawn. Anytime I'm opening a chapter and it's like Arinda, I'm like next, next. <laughs> Don't chapter. care about her. I skip all know. the right. Uh, I could not care less. Um, her so her stupid bangs. <laughs> that's so. That's where I started really. Quit messing uh, up the Tide Defenders project, Arinda. Yeah. Oh man, we're gonna get into that. Um, but so Thrawn uh, instantly became one of my favorite characters. I was a huge Sherlock fan, Sherlock Holmes fan growing up, mm-hmm. and he's that character. Um, and for all of you out there who are not a fan of the Rise of Skywalker, or specifically not a fan of Ray's heritage, we're in April now, so. Come on, catch up. Uh, but, you know, when everybody found out that Ray was a Palpatine, mm-hmm. everybody was like, no, she's Ray from nowhere. Like, I, I felt like people were either calling her a Mary Sue because she was a nobody and she shouldn't be that powerful. And then all of a sudden, everybody was pissed off that she came from a powerful bloodline because that's why she's powerful. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. there was nobody that was like, whenever she was from nowhere, I was like, oh, okay. When I found out she was a Palpatine, I was like, Heck yeah. And at the end of Rise of Skywalker, she's like, Ray Skywalker. I was like, frick yeah, welcome in. Come on. Water's fine. The Skywalker clan. And no matter what, like, Star Wars fans are so toxic. I feel like there's either Star Wars fans that they just love freaking everything. That's that's more my style. Is mm-hmm. I'm like, Jar Jar and the Clone Wars? Don't mind what I do. I'll take two scoops. You know? And then there's the people who it's like, original trilogy or die. Like, and that's, that's it. Latin in a bottle. Uh, but those are the same people who forget that George Lucas directed the prequels, yep. but they hate that, you know? So anyways, all that to say, if you want a Ray from Nowhere character to root for, Thrawn. this is your guy. He's literally from nowhere. He's from nowhere. He's he's the outcast. He's, he's from, the underdog. He's so from nowhere, he has to tell the entire galaxy about where he's from, because nobody knows. Nobody knows. It's a mystery. Uh, and so, if you're looking for the character that's going against the odds, that doesn't have... Force abilities, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, none to speak of. Doesn't have force abilities. Doesn't have. Isn't a Jedi or Sith. Doesn't have a powerful bloodline to pull from. Doesn't just start off. You know, Vader walks mm-hmm. in. He's like, hmm, nice new empire. Guess I'll run it. Mm-hmm. You know, like he's not that guy. Yeah. You know, this is the guy you're rooting for. So if you don't know about Thrawn, get to stepping. Come on. Yeah. Get on. So that's what we're talking about today. Um, it takes a special person 
to not only win over the Emperor, uh-huh. but then to separately, without really any blessing from the Emperor influence, to win over Darth Vader. Uh-huh. Sheerly through skill and ability and being able to impress them, that's a Results. big deal. If you can impress or even surprise mm-hmm. those two individuals, you're doing something incredibly right. Yeah. So, uh, let's jump into it. Yeah, let's do okay? it. Okay? So we're going to focus on canon, and then when something cool sticks out in Legends, we'll we'll jump in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> Thrawn, when we meet him, uh, both in canon and Legends, he's already a member of the Chiss Ascendancy. Mm-hmm. Plug, our own podcast. And uh, and he's... Come on now. <laughs> you know, he just like, walks through the door. Like, Hello. Hello. Uh, but he's already... Not only is he already there, but he's already a high-ranking official. Mm-hmm. He's already uh, a captain or an admiral or something of the like. He's already... You see him in flashbacks, I think, where he's a lieutenant. And mm-hmm. He's wearing the maroon uniform, which absorbs blaster burns. Come on, Empire. Uh, <laughs> Figure it out. Right? They've got, like... Also, come on, Hasbro! bro Fabric. That looks like a t-shirt. Yeah. Um, Pretty sick. But he's, he was a lieutenant at that time. That's in the middle of the Clone Wars. Mm-hmm. He's obviously a high-ranking official because we see somebody who's uh, a high admiral in the Chiss Ascendancy, Admiral Arlani, and they appear to be contemporaries. Mm-hmm. You know, So he was obviously a very high-ranking official. He's on the up and up. He was handpicked by the Estocra of, of the Chiss Ascendancy to be the person to kind of infiltrate the Empire. Yep. So... Um, so the backstory that we have right now, as of canon, is the trilogy that we've mm-hmm. got, and the Thrawn trilogy that we have, Thrawn, Thrawn Alliances, and Thrawn Treason, all take place before Star Wars Rebels, where Thrawn goes into play there. Mm-hmm. Well, um, uh, the third book happens after some of the Rebels incidents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It kind of drops you right in yeah. between season three and four of Rebels. Mm-hmm. Um, but it all takes place, I guess, before it's all before, before the, the last thing Rebels, we see of sure. Rebels yeah. with Ron. Um, and so the first one is all about his, you know, Rise meeting the Empire. Yeah. And so when we when we first meet him, now Thrawn Alliances, the second book, has a then and now mm-hmm. aspect to it where you yeah. go further back into yeah, the Clone it Wars. It shows you, uh, well... What is the second one? Alliances? Yeah, okay, sorry. I, I had a brain fart there for a second. The second one kind of shows you um, when he first comes into the Empire, Sheev, the Emperor, already mm-hmm. knows about Thrawn because Anakin had met Thrawn during the Clone Wars. Mm-hmm. And so you kind of see the relationship between Thrawn and Anakin and then Thrawn navigating that with Thrawn and Vader. Mm-hmm. And Thrawn totally knows who Vader is. Um, he's dropping hints all the time. He's like, we've been here before. And Vader's like, you've been here before. <laughs> you know, he's, he's like, nobody heard that. You know, <laughs> he's like, this is the most guarded secret in all of the Empire. And yeah. he's casually just dropping hints. And he's yeah. like, my mistake. You so know? I guess we'll go chronologically. Yeah. Because that makes the most sense. Um, if you want to read them, uh, we'll put some pictures here. Now that we're good at that. We'll put some pictures here of the... <laughs> the books. Uh, Samo does that. Bless his heart. Um, but the first book that comes out is Thrawn. It's just called Thrawn. And then Thrawn uh, Alliances. Now, something that's really cool, I need to go back and buy, <clears throat> now that the stimulus check is hitting the accounts, <laughs> uh, is uh, San Diego Comic Con always has alternative covers for books. And I got really lucky. I had a friend uh, that was at San Diego Comic Con this last year. And they got me the Thrawn Treason alternate cover where he's sitting in his chair with all this uh, chist behind him. Mm-hmm. But, glowing red eye. Yeah, and that's kind of what our that's what our uh, mm-hmm. logo is kind of based on is you've got Thrawn and they got all the chist behind him. Um, but the book Alliances, the official cover, the paperback and the mass market and all that stuff is Thrawn and Vader side by side. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the alternative cover that you can only get at San Diego Comic-Con is from the, f- the flashback period in the book, and you've got uh, Clone Wars Anakin, which is cool because he has the Clone Wars uh-huh. armor on, but it's Hayden Christensen's likeness. Because mm-hmm. um, if you watch Clone Wars, the Clone Wars artwork kind of looks more like the guy that plays Anakin. 
voice acting wise. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, uh, but it's got Clone Wars Anakin with Clone Wars Thrawn, uh, or not Clone Wars, but like Clone Wars era Thrawn with the the Chiss uniform on. Yeah. So I need to go back and buy that. It's just super cool. But anyways, the first we meet Thrawn, we're back in the Clone Wars, and there's a planet called Mokucha. Uh Timothy Zahn just goes. And that's his planet names. He's like, throw a few apostrophes in there. Yeah, whenever he's like, uh, Vernisker, how about Nobel? How about that? I will see you... One- I'd like to buy four consonants, Bob. Yeah. You know what would be cool? Russian. Brock Rechner. Uh, throw backwards out in there. So nice little curveball. You meet Thrawn, and uh, where do we meet him with when he first comes in contact with Anakin... In the flashbacks from treason or from alliances. All right, so that would be there in orbit, actually. Uh-huh. And uh, Anakin sees an incoming ship, and Thrawn hails him, and basically Thrawn knows a lot about what Anakin's doing already, which Anakin's immediately suspicious of. But anybody who knows Thrawn's like, ah, Thrawn just knows what's going on. Uh-huh. Uh, but Thrawn essentially uh, lures Anakin into his good graces enough to where they'll work together. Uh-huh. Um, and it just moves forward from there. Yeah. yeah. And so Padme's on a mission and she gets kidnapped or mm-hmm. something. Well, yeah, she sends Anakin kind of like a cryptic message. She's looking to meet one of her former handmaidens um, who's kind of on a, a hot trail. Mm-hmm. And uh, all of a sudden she drops out of contact. Which right. Which Anakin's like, screw everything else. You know, he's out of contact with the Jedi Order. Padme's in trouble. Everybody else can die. I'm going to help Padme. Dude. Freaking Mark Thompson's Anakin sounds like uh, Michael Scott doing Jim at the Dunnies. He's like, hey, dude, you go listen to some records? <laughs> and freaking, that's what Anakin sounds like. So that's, I just see. Bad just see see her all like this. I'm going to help her. That's my Anakin impersonation. impersonation. Uh, so we that's kind of where we meet him. <laughs> <in. laughs> where every, every death is <laughs> every Anakin. Death is Anakin. <laughs> George was like, killed it. That was so realistic, Hayden. Wow. Anybody else? This guy's a whiz. <laughs> so we meet Thrawn, and he's talking to Anakin, and um, they, you know, Thrawn, of course, you've got Anakin, who's super powerful in the Force, many chlorine count through the roof. Yeah. But Thrawn is the one that's really putting the puzzle pieces together. Well, and here's what's interesting about Thrawn interacting with anybody that's Force sensitive, especially people that. Are very strong in the force and expect to just be able to read people's emotions they all have trouble reading Thrawn's mind mm-hmm. because it's so atypical you know right. they always talk about it seems like a really high order like it it's machine and it's just taken but they can't get through to it at all they can't and I think part it. of that is because uh, you know you'll see people you know Obi-Wan will say you know your thoughts betray you mm-hmm. you're thinking of your mother you're nervous yeah. you know breathe uh, and then you've got Thrawn, who's like, I am a machine. You yeah. know, like, he's got emotions, but it's like, not really. Yeah, they're not important to him. You know, he's he is the greater good kind of guy. He's like Spock on steroids Yeah, in Star Wars. So just better all around. Uh, so... Uh, you've got I mean, them. You're pissing off the Marvel fans. You're pissing off the Trekkies. You're pissing off other Star Wars Bring fans. On. Uh, so you've got them working together. They solve that mystery, and then uh, pretty much that's a capsule in itself. And probably, you know, twenty something years later is the next time that we see Thrawn. Uh, and so he's on this uh, this planet. He's got his hair all grown out. And if you read the the Thrawn, they made a comic of the first Thrawn novel. That's I think six parts. Um, <clears throat> And it's really cool because you get to see him and he's like got his hair all grown out mm-hmm. and it's just like Tarzan but Thrawn. Uh, and Thrawn he's, he's basically Thronzan. Oh, maybe that's the episode's name. Thronzan. Thronzan. Uh, so you see, and this is very similar to his legends uh, beginnings with the Empire. There's a short story, a short story called uh, Mist Encounter by Timothy Zahn, obviously. Um, shout out Timothy Zahn. Yeah. Like, he's come up with one of the strongest, most in-depth, best characters we've ever had. Well, and here's the thing. 
He is, to my knowledge, the only author that started something in Legends, and they're like, hey, we need to redo this, but please, will you, for the love of God, write it Mm -hmm. for canon? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because who else is going to be able to encapsulate that character in the the strategy? Dude, if they would have had anybody else, and they, they, you know, Claudia Gray and all those people have done an amazing job. I love, um, you know, Daniel Jose Older from, that did Last Shot, the Lando Mm -hmm. novel, amazing. But if they would have let anybody else do Thrawn, I would have been like, that's it. Yeah. We're done here. Um, they did the right thing. They brought him back on. Yeah. And I think you're Incredible. right. I think he's the singular Legends character that they were like, we need to bring him back. We need to give him full justice. Mm-hmm. Let's do a trilogy. In fact, let's do another trilogy just yeah. about him before we meet him. And just to kind of give a little point of reference of what Thrawn would look like had anybody else done the books, look at Thrawn in the Rebel series versus <laughs> Thrawn in the books. And that's kind of the difference maker there. I think the problem with with having Thrawn in Rebels is that you there's no way that you can show how good he is at what he does. Right. Because the Rebels have to be able to survive at some point. Right. And my thing was, especially when they <coughs> tied Hera and Chopper and some of those people into Rogue One, I was like, well, crap, they got to survive yeah. this. Um, so, anyways, we'll get into that. Yeah. But... Uh, there could have been more. And maybe there will be. Um, but, <clears throat> so when we meet him, he meets Anakin, he helps solve the case, and that really is established just to show that his memory is perfect, he remembers Anakin, mm-hmm. he even sees the similarities from Vader to Anakin, and <clears throat> which is a tall order because Vader's whole existence is... You know, that name no longer has any meaning to me. Like, he's, right. his whole existence is, especially once Padme dies, he's like, well, I guess I'm just going to do my own thing. Erase the past. You know, you know, kill it if you have to. Yeah. And he's just doing his own thing. He's not Anakin. He's not a Jedi. He's not, like, he's ruled by his emotions, but his only emotion is, is rage. You know? And so there's not... Like, the, the greater good side of Anakin he's tried to put to bed, and Thrawn just picks it apart and is mm-hmm. totally like, no, I know who you are. Yeah. And there's one specific part well, where... I think Thrawn's just, like, <clears throat> the only person that could have the big picture view to be able to realize, well, Anakin went missing. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, He's yeah. not just dead. You know? <coughs> it's just, I don't know, Thrawn's just that kind of guy who's going to be able to look at all the pieces and to everybody else that are accepting those individually, but he's putting the puzzle together. Right. You know? And he's got this larger view from mm-hmm. having this previous experience. Because um, think about it, like a lot of people who work with Anakin during the Clone Wars, they're no more. Yeah. You know, the clones have been decommissioned or they died during the Clone War. Rex is gone, Ahsoka's gone, Obi-Wan's gone. Like anybody that works hand to hand with him mm-hmm. besides Palpatine. And Tarkin, that's it. Yeah, you know, um, and so you've got uh, that that space, and then you fast forward. He gets discovered by the the Empire, and he basically bamboozles his way into getting captured on purpose mm-hmm. uh, in the Thrawn novel. And immediately they recognize that he's got a different level of capability when it comes to strategy. Now the difference here from Legends is that. In Legends, he really was exiled. Mm-hmm. You know, in the new canon, the Chiss kind of plant him because they need to know what the Empire is about. Yeah. And they trust Thrawn. When they're trying to, to assess, to like, get in. threat levels because they see the Grisk mm-hmm. um, and, you know, other out there threats. And they're trying to see who they can team up with mm-hmm. and who they just kind of need to destroy. Yeah. And is the... <coughs> excuse me. Is the Empire uh, an ally or are they a foe? Can mm-hmm. they be trusted? You know, there's, I can't remember where it comes from, if it's from a novel or whatever, but I remember there's a part where Thrawn analyzes and says, well, if the Rebellion would have been the greater mm-hmm. ally, I would have joined the Rebellion. Yeah. And that's a huge what if. Yeah. Um, but, so Thrawn gains access into the Empire, goes to the Imperial Academy, and is uh, teamed up with Eli Vanto, mm-hmm. uh, which is basically this uh, super smart kid, mm-hmm. but he's from like... Deep South space. Yeah, he's from Wild Space, so nobody takes him seriously. Yeah. Timothy and, uh, Zahn makes him sound like he's probably from somewhere within 15 square miles of this very location. Uh, dang, Thrawn! Back down! <laughs> but, 
Thrawn, I can't believe you can't tell they're making fun of you. They, uh, but the beautiful thing is there's a connection there because because Eli is from so far away mm-hmm. from the core worlds, he speaks a language that is called Cybisti. Mm-hmm. And Cybisti is a bridge language that Thrawn can speak because he can't speak basic. Yeah. So Thrawn speaks obviously probably whatever language the Chiss have. Chiss? I don't know what it's called. I guess it's just, um, I think it's because uh, you see Eli learning it in treason. I mm-hmm. think it's just Chiss. And so he's, but he also speaks broken Cybisti. Eli speaks Cybisti. And so there's that connection point. And so they yeah. go into the Imperial Academy together. And there's a, there's a frustration there because Eli is a great student, a great soldier. Chiyun. Chiyun, there you go. There it is. I knew and, it was something. Um, <clears throat> so Eli's doing his due diligence and he's going through the ranks. But Thrawn is so good at what he does that he is just shooting up through the ranks. And he's experiencing literal racism from yeah. other races, from humans and stuff, against him. He's the only non-human pretty much there. Mm-hmm. And so, by the end of uh, the original Thrawn book, you've got him as an admiral. He's not a grand admiral yet. Mm-hmm. Um, he is at the very At the end. very, very end. He gets his promotion. That's how the book ends. But he's an admiral, and there's a character named Night Swan. And Night Swan is like the Moriarty to his Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Like he's a brilliant character. Mm-hmm. Um, and the whole time, Thrawn's like experiencing comeuppance that he's used to getting with other people. Mm-hmm. And he's like, what is going on here? Well, and at the same time, I don't think he's like bamboozled by it. But he's got a vested interest because I think for him it's like a worthy opponent. Mm-hmm. You know, like yeah. he's, he just sees somebody that's kind of even approaching his level and it's just something well, it's kind of like in sports by. you tend to play better playing with better people around you mm-hmm. you know yeah, I think he just enjoyed the challenge because it seemed like the rest of it's just child's play and yeah. he finally got this person who's you know stepping up to the plate gotta see what he's about right so by the end of the first Thrawn novel Thrawn figures out who Night Swan is he beats him and he moves on and becomes a Grand Admiral for helping um, with some uh, some planet. I can't remember what it is. But there's a ton of casualties and it's not really his call to have killed all those innocent civilians. But it's kind of like a backwards door. It's like a backdoor thing because it gets him the credibility within the Empire to become a Grand Admiral, even though it's not his style to kill innocents. By the way, uh, somebody who does work with Anakin... <clears throat> sorry, I was thinking about it. I couldn't remember mm-hmm. his name. Uh, Admiral Yularen. Yeah. Who's in Yularen. ISB. You know, he's one of the captains that mm-hmm. he works with. The guy that talks like this. Yeah. And uh, he's... Uh, He's one of those guys that I feel like got caught up in the Imperial machine that was a good guy at heart. Yeah, he's uh, kind of like the good guy counterpart to Tarkin. You know what I mean? Like Tarkin was kind of there for the big transition. Yularen was there for the big transition. I think Yularen really humanizes the Empire. Yeah. Because when you see it, you just see a Stormtrooper helmet and you're like, those are bad guys. Yeah. But Yularen is that guy that is a really great guy, but he's caught up in the machine. Yeah. And he doesn't have the force ability. He doesn't have the intellectual ability like Thrawn has yeah. to pick apart what's going on. Uh, so by Thrawn uh, alliances, uh, or Thrawn alliance, him and Vader are working together. <clears throat> and it, it's a really good story, but as far as just giving you the backstory, there's not a whole lot besides the fact that you go back in time to see him working with Anakin, and he starts kind of picking apart Vader and Anakin. And mm-hmm. by the end... There's a specific line where, I guess if you're going to read the book, skip forward like 30, 45 seconds, but kind of jump into the Chiss, uh, the young children that help them navigate hyperspace and so, what they call those. Uh, dang, this is a big reveal. So I emphasize... Heads up. If you want to read the books and you want to be surprised... Just hit the forward arrow button like five times. Uh, but Thrawn is trying to guard the secret of the Chiss Ascendancy. Essentially, instead of having Nava computers, they have Force-sensitive children that have what they call uh, Third Sight. Mm-hmm. And instead of having computers that 
plot drop jump points that are safe. They basically just go into hyperspace. They put this kid behind the wheel. They're like, drive, kid. Yeah, and, and they go into kind of like a force yeah, trance. Yeah, they go into a force trance, and if they see like an asteroid, they're just like, meep. Mm-hmm. Little star. Meep. And so the chi word that translates, you know, from what they call these navigators. So Vader's like, you know, we have a funny name for them. Yeah, and so Chis, or uh, Thrawn is basically just got, in, got this secret, secrety secret smirk mm-hmm. the whole time. And he finally talks Vader into um, trying this technique uh, because they don't have, like, exact plot points. He needs him to sense it in the forest. Because they're on the far edge of, yeah. you know, and wild so space. He tells him the Chis word for the navigators, and he's like, it roughly translates to Skywalker. Skywalker. And he looks over, and Vader's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a perfect, it's like, and Timothy Zahn, man. Yeah. He is an amazing, the only way I can talk about Timothy Zahn and his brilliance is when I was a kid, well, we're both kids at one point, you go to a restaurant and you get the little kid's menu that has games on it so you shut up while you're family's trying to be out to eat right and they have the little circular puzzles that's like can you get to the middle of the maze but by the time you know you're four or five you realize i'm gonna start in the middle and i'm gonna draw my way out of this thing that way i get it right the first time so i don't look like an idiot going Ur, oh no that way and that's timothy zahn dude like you're like I, now i know where you're going with this yeah and i don't know i i've never written a novel before so i don't know how the process works but the way that he's like got all these spaghettis and mm-hmm. he's like it's actually one string, everyone. Right. Well, and it's like Timothy Zahn kills it. I have that. spent many hours thinking about it, and I'm like, he's making all the rules. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he's controlling. But he's he's the guy in Bugs Life playing himself in chess. Yeah. But uh, no two ways about it. It's still brilliant. You know. But even the, he's, he's to me, like, I the thought that he created physics. a like Timothy Zahn has created amazing content within. A very cramped storyline, right. which I think plays into Rebels. So right. at the end of Thrawn Alliances, uh, he's basically assigned to go figure out what's going on with the with the Lethal mm-hmm. Rebels, which ties directly into Rebels Season 3, I think Thrawn comes in. Uh, I think that's correct. Yeah, because the binge is at the very end of Season 3. Mm-hmm. And that's his uh, big defeat that Vader keeps bringing up in mm-hmm. Treason. Yeah. So alliances. Um, so he's over Lothal, and Thrawn. His big thing in Legends and in Canon is that he thinks that the Death Star is a mistake. Yeah, and he thinks that uh, basically, you brought this up. Yeah, amazing point. That's Exegol. Yeah, Palpatine's ultimate plan for victory would be the so, final would, order. It, yeah, it was the realization Bam. of Thrawn's original suggestion. Yeah, Thrawn's just idea have was a very mobile fleet. Have just freaking be everywhere it wants. Ants. Yeah. Versus the magnifying glass. Mm-hmm. You know, cuz if you break the magnifying glass then you're screwed, but mm-hmm. if you have ants, yeah. then you have ants. Yeah. You know what I'm they saying? Just be everywhere. Uh, and so Thrawn's thing was and again, the only Woody Allen movie I've seen is Ants, which I loved. <laughs> What's that from? The Office. Oh. So you've got Thrawn who's telling the Emperor. And Thrawn also has this character where he's like, he so believes what he says mm-hmm. that he'll say it to anybody. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's the only guy besides Vader in this whole you know spiel that's not playing politics. Yeah. Like even Tarkin, who is pretty on the nose, is playing politics yeah. to some degree. And then you've got Thrawn who's like, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> it's stupid. It's a stupid idea, Sheev. And uh, I don't know why I kind of turned into Trump there for a second. But uh, but it. you've got you know Thrawn telling Palpatine. And Thrawn does not know about the Death Star. He's not in that circle. Yet. But he knows about it. Like he's putting two and two together. And by the time you get to Thrawn treason... Uh, I think he knows more than he lets on. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Is he's, he's not supposed to know. Yeah, nobody but he totally knows to know. what's nobody going on. Nobody outside of basically... Uh, Krennic and the Emperor is supposed yeah. to know. You know, Tarkin's in there because Tarkin and Sheev are like golf buddies. <laughs> uh, so you've got uh, Thrawn and he... Nice shots, my lord. You find him... Yeah, like he misses the putt and he's like, very close. <laughs> he turns around. Uh, but... the next time. You've got... Uh, you've got Krennic who by all accounts is like a bumbling idiot scientist that wants to be a military guy. And he's just like... 
He's got the he, he's, he's got the short guy complex. He's kind of like, got a cool character. I in love Krennic. I think Krennic uh, is super cool. In Rogue One, he's kind of got a cool thing going on where he's like, oh, it's a miracle, you know. Mm-hmm. He's got the he's you know kind of in charge of things, but uh, especially when you get into like his second ranking official uh, assistant Ronan, mm-hmm. they're just everything they do. You're like. Bro, could you have picked a more stupid thing to do? Mm-hmm. You know, they're just so inside their own heads. You you find out very quickly, and it, it's you find this out in Rogue One too. But in Thrawn uh, Treason, uh, Krennic is basically trying to. Um, Krennic's a douchebag. He just is okay. Uh, like freaking his best friend that like basically he wrote his coattails through school was Galen Erso, and he's like. It'd be a shame if we killed your whole family and then changed it to the Death Star Project. Come on, Galen, we're going. You know, he's just, he's looking out for number one. He right. doesn't care about anybody but himself. And he's not as good as everybody thinks he is. Or as good as he thinks he is. And he hates the Empire and the Emperor. I'm not really sure what his shtick is. Yeah, to I don't be know. Honest. Maybe he, he's one of those guys that you're He just like, has no loyalty to anybody. Think you can rule? Right. Like, what's the end goal here? Right. Um, but he doesn't like the Emperor, he doesn't like Vader, he hates Tarkin, and he thinks Thrawn's overrated. Yeah. So basically, uh, at the beginning of Thrawn Treason, there's all of these things that are getting, these shipments are getting stolen. Yeah. And Thrawn's like, you mean the Death Star stuff? Mm-hmm. And everybody's like, whoa, what's that? You know, like, and he's and Vader's like, it. nobody heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Stop talking about that. Um, Pulls but, his cape up. Shut up. <laughs> Kill you right he, now. He makes a wall. Yeah, pulls his cape up. <laughs> but his his voice is a microphone. Just like quarter. But it's, he's whispering. But it's so loud. I'm serious. <laughs> so uh, you've got Krennic basically says, if you're so good at what you do, you've got. I think it's like 48 hours or some crap. Yeah, he gives him a week. But if you think about it, and like you have to do space travel that takes like four days. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like so he gives him he's a week. Like, oh, I'll give you half an hour to <laughs> solve this mystery. Why are these crates are going mis- missing? What's yeah. with there's like Minox involved and all this crap. And if you can figure it out, then maybe uh, I can't remember what it was. He could he go he could the go high defender to funds. Right. So if Thrawn loses the wager, he gets all the funds dedicated to the TIE Defender project. If he mm-hmm. wins, obviously, Thrawn gets to keep going. Right. So, um... And Thrawn's like, okay. Deal. You know? <laughs> and so he solves the mystery, obviously. Yeah. I don't want to go into all the details of what's what. But um, by the end of this novel, it's tying into the end of Season 4 of Rebels. Governor Price from the Fall is freaking... Losing her marbles. If you haven't seen Rebels, it basically all takes... Excuse me. It all takes place... <laughs> it all takes place on a planet called Lothal. We never leave Lothal. We're stuck on Lothal the whole series. Uh, Most for that one time when we see the... Uh, what's his name's planet? Uh, Zeb. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so... Secret Zeb planet. We basically... Uh, Arinda Price is out of her water. She's out of her depth. She can't. She doesn't know what she's doing. She's the worst. And there's a fuel depot that is basically what all the Tide Defenders and stuff are running on. Mm-hmm. It's a. It's a. You know, for us in in real time and uh, on the Earth, it would be a multi-billion, if not trillion, dollar, you know, fuel depot that's running everything. Mm-hmm. You know, we're from Houston, so. When, you know, there was a storm a couple of months back and it knocked out just a small portion of I-10 that runs from California to Florida. And it was like companies were taking hours long detour just because this one little part of the bridge Mm -hmm. was knocked out. And that basically, that bridge is this fuel depot that's fueling everything that Thrawn's working on. And Governor Price is so freaked out by the rebellion and she knows she's at the end of her rope. She knows Mm -hmm. she's messed up multiple times. Tarkin's been there, Vader's been there, Thrawn's been sent there, and she knows if she doesn't get the Rebels, she's basically going to get the axe. And so her idea is to get some AT-ATs, which you made a hilarious point the other day, if you call them AT-ATs. Dude, he was like, uh, he meaning the Jedi from Fallen Order, he's like, I just destroyed an AT-AT, that's what I bring to the table, and I was like, what do you call an AT-ST, an AT Street? <laughs> Frickin' it's an AT-AT. Yes. Continuity, please. Alright, so, um... When Arenda sees that, uh, she's like, we got to destroy the rebels, whatever we do. And she blows up the fuel depot. So, oh God. 
So by the end of the last Thrawn she's novel... She's another primary example of bureaucrat trying to be military commander. Doesn't Here's work. Here's the thing. She's in charge of an entire planet, mm-hmm. which to her, anybody really is a big deal. But within the Empire, she's a very small fish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you so she, she blows up the fuel depot and it pretty much cripples the TIE Defender project. Thrawn's pissed. Idiots! And uh, he tells her, we'll deal with you when we get back. Yeah. And by this, by this, yeah, he is as angry as you're going to see him. And by the end of this episode, or by the end of that next episode, is the finale of Rebels. Mm-hmm. And Thrawn comes in, and he has him dead to rights. And the thing that Rebels did, I, I liked Rebels. And there were some some episodes of Rebels were on par with some of the best episodes of Clone Wars, like Twin Suns, uh, World Between Worlds, uh, Twilight of the Apprentice, where you're on Malachor with like Maul and Vader and Ahsoka. The highlight episodes are really good, but then they do things that I'm like, well, yeah, stop. Uh, and one of those is the Rebels can't be beat. The Rebels can't get beaten. Yeah. And like Hera's the only one, Kanan included, that is competent at all. Like, towards the end, Kanan's like, yeah, I'm blind. Like, whatever. And it's like, how are you more competent blind? Here's the only one that keeps the level head. Ezra, you know Ezra. And so, uh, at the end, Thrawn's got everybody dead to rights. And Ezra, who had, it's, I guess, if you are rooting for the rebels, it's a really cool thing. But I was rooting 110% for Thrawn to just, like, you know what? Let's just turn this planet to glass and sell it to a glass company. <laughs> like that's what I wanted. Um, but Ezra shows up, and the end of Thrawn's story so far in canon is that there's a species of space whale called Pergil, and Pergil uh, are able to have hyperspace travel naturally. Like that's something they're able to do by by their own nature, and that's how people kind of discovered hyperspace travel is by mimicking their flight or whatever Mm -hmm. so you're on the chimera it's a huge superstar destroyer they've got everybody dead to rights they're basically sitting on top of their little sibling that doesn't have any breath left and they're like say uncle say uncle you know and out of freaking nowhere comes these ridiculous looking space whales and they attach their tentacles to thrawn's uh spaceship the chimera thrawn's got his freaking pistol trained on Ezra from point blank. He's like shooting at him. Uh, and basically, I was like, for a second, I was like, Thrawn's gonna kill Ezra. By the way, was... we know from the Thrawn novels that he is a competent hand to hand combatant. Yeah. And he is a sharp shooter. Yeah. So that's, you have some, you know, obviously it's all canon, but you have some things in the novel where it's like, yeah, like not, Doc he's Holliday. Not just, he's not just brains, you know. Yeah, he's he's, he's, he's a very great fighter, capable fighter. And then you have him from me to this computer, and he's like, "How come I can't hit this kid?" Mm-hmm. You know. Um, and so the very last thing we see from Thrawn and Ezra at this point is the Pergil attach themselves to the ISB Chimera, Thrawn's flagship, and they just take him into outer space, and he's just gone. And that's the last thing we know about Thrawn. And so. Um, I think it's just a very inelegant way for him to get beat compared to how he died in Legends. Right. So we don't know what's next. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, and really the character from the new books and from Rebels is still very cool, very exciting, very competent, very wise, very smart. Mm-hmm. Um, but Legends is really where he made his, mm-hmm. his you know, he made well, his living. Because he was the soul head of the mm-hmm. empire at that point like mm-hmm. he was the one that was holding it all together right so he had, his success rate was much higher because a lot of the times you see in rebels if he loses it, it's not his fault there's one time where he has him stuck on um i think it was pelion who no it wasn't pelion because pelion shows up for like two seconds at the finale yep. it was some other guy that was a weenie that was like i'm not losing my chance for glory because yep. he had them he had them pinned on um Hera's home planet, I can't remember, Ryloth. He has him stuck there on Ryloth, and he's like, surrender or die, basically. Mm -hmm. And he has, you know, he's a chess player, so he's got all his pieces laid out in a perfect maneuver, and one of the other admirals or lieutenants or whatever 
moves to intercept a ship that Thrawn's like, don't move, don't move, don't move. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm not going to lose my chance for glory. He moves out of it. And what he really does is he cuts a hole in the blanket. Yeah, he makes an opening. And so stuff like that, it's believable, um, but it it still puts a mark on Thrawn's record, which sucks. Um, We're running a little bit long, but it's okay. Uh, So in Legends, you first meet Thrawn during the Outbound Flight Project. And the Outbound Flight Project was something um, designed by a Jedi named Joris Sabaoth. And his I idea think, uh, was... I think Thompson called him Sabaoth. Yeah. Timothy Zonist has corrected it. <laughs> um, they say uh, Sabaoth in the Thrawn audiobook, but mm-hmm. then when Outbound Flight came out, it's Sabaoth. I don't know. I think Zahn specifically wrote to Del Rey and was like, hey, this is how you say it. Um, but... He's a Jedi Master, and he's very, like... He's kind of on the edge of darkness. Mm-hmm. And so... Before, uh, basically, there there was the hard line where they were like, there's no such thing as a great Jedi. Yeah. He was a great Jedi. Yeah. He is... Oh, wow. We're leaving the station, folks. <laughs> uh, so, Outbound Flight is a project that he came up with that is heading towards the Unknown Regions, and it's basically expanding uh, the... Now we're on the beach. <laughs> Just relax. No, no I'm trying to do this freaking that was ASMR. I'm not sexy. Uh, so uh, they're trying to expand and, and, and just... <laughs> they're trying to go... Now we're going over here. Now we're going over here. Uh, they're trying to expand and go basically f- as far as they can freaking go into the unknown regions... And start a colony there. And it's basically, uh, it's almost kind of like connecting the dots. Like they're just going to shoot super far over here. And if that goes successfully, they'll shoot super far over here. And it just expands the net of the Republic. Just think about Space England. Yeah. They're like, the sun never what sets. We, I don't know, took over the whole planet. Yeah, exactly. Except for the whole galaxy. Um, so. And then we just kept going. Joris Sabaoth it, uh, takes... It's him and like six other Jedi Masters and like 12 Jedi Padawans and 50,000 crew members. Because of course, there's billions of people and it's this giant spaceship. And it's going into the Unknown Regions. And actually, I don't know if you know this because I don't know if you've read Outbound Flight. But Anakin and Obi-Wan are on the ship. They're on the thing. And they're going. And Palpatine actually uh, finds a way to divert the path for like two seconds and have them get off because he doesn't want Anakin going that far because when you go, the, the plan was just to go and stay. And of course, you know, I don't know, I don't think Zahn really touched on it, but I can see Anakin fighting against that tooth and nail, of course, because it's during the Clone Wars and mm-hmm. he's already kind of got a thing with Padme. <laughs> <laughs> don't even want to go there, but anyways, he... Uh, so Palpatine ends up getting Obi-Wan and Anakin off, uh, you know, off the ship, and then it starts going. And uh, there is a uh, guy named um, Kenlin Doriana, I want to say, and that's Palpatine's right-hand man. And Doriana actually works for the Separatists, and he's answering to Sidious. Mm. And it's funny because Doriana's like, yeah, Palpatine doesn't know what he's doing. Sidious, that's the guy. And, you know, meanwhile, she was like, eh? Also, you know? the guy at the beginning of Bugs Life playing chess against yeah, himself. Yeah, exactly. But so, even more. Basically, long, super long story short. Except for this um, one, I win. Republic wins, I win. They talk, I win. He talks, uh, basically, Thrawn destroys Outbound Flight because it's coming into Chiss territory, and he's like, we're not doing that. And his preemptive attack of them before they can get into unknown space... That would have been his exile. ...is kind of what is the straw that breaks the camel's back yeah. with the chist because they're... They don't believe in preemptive they're a, attacks. They're a brilliant military people, but they don't believe in preemptive striking because they're like, that's not peace, mm-hmm. you know? It's one of those things where it's like, you know, Teddy Roosevelt said, walk softly, carry a big stick. You know, that's kind of their style too, is we've got this amazing military, um, but we're not going to infringe unless we're infringed upon. Mm-hmm. And Thrawn was like, this guy looks dangerous. <laughs> and he destroys outbound flight. Yeah, he's very much Bugs Bunny at the bar. Yeah. yeah. So you've got uh, so Joris Sabaoth dies, but uh, a clone of him is created, and he is the guardian of the Emperor's cloning facility from Legends Ironic. on 
a planet, right? How perverse. Uh, on a planet called clones Wayland. Making clones. And so it's cool because Zahn ties this huge storyline together where this is the first time we see Thrawn. And then the first appearance of Thrawn, which is actually much later in the future, is in Heir to the Empire. And Joris Sabaoth, uh, or Jeruus, I guess, because he's a clone. You know, mm-hmm. Timothy Zahn did the double U thing. Yeah, the little Ook. Um, and so a clone of Master Sabaoth is the guardian of Wayland, which is the Emperor's cloning facility. And uh, Sabaoth joins forces with Thrawn, actually, in the Heir to the Empire trilogy because he does what's called a battle meld. And he basically goes into a trance. I think they call it battle meditation. Or, yeah. So a meld, I guess, is multiple groups. Um, and a ma- battle meditation is, is just him, and he's, like, using the force to boost the confidence and the accuracy and stuff of his troops. Well, and they're all receiving the same instructions at once, mm-hmm. so they're much more it's, coordinated. It's much more like droids, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, you fast forward, and so a clone of the guy that is in charge of outbound flight is the one that's also in charge of Thrawn's military mm-hmm. in the Heir of the Empire trilogy. And uh, basically, in that series... Thrawn has been in charge of basically expanding the Empire into the Unknown Regions, but he's kind of keeping his foot on the brake because at the end of the day, he's more loyal to the Chiss Ascendancy mm-hmm. and he doesn't want the Empire infringing upon them. And so uh, that is um, where you kind of meet Thrawn, and Thrawn basically comes back into the Core Worlds because he doesn't think that the New Republic has what it takes to rule. And uh, there's a little bit more of an evil side to Legends Thrawn because he's loyal to the Empire further than mm-hmm. Canon Thrawn is now. Um, and so there's a battle going on. There's a war against the Imperial Remnant versus the New Republic. And for all intents and purposes, Thrawn has the New Republic pretty much dead to rights. Like, he's beating them on every front. They can't figure it out. Even Luke and Leia are like, mm-hmm. who is this character yeah. that's that's one-upping us? Yeah, and there are several times where if they find out Thrawn's there, they just jet. Yeah. You know, because they don't and, want to uh, win. The Clone Wars actually used uh, the what's called the Mark Sable maneuver, I believe it's called. Mark Sable. Okay. Uh, and it's basically where you let a ship look, you know, kind of like a fish kind of just turns over when it dies. You let the ship turn over as if it's, as if it's dying, um, and you take the top of the ship and face it towards your enemy. And when they go to basically ravage the ship, all of your fighters exit out the yeah, back side. The side that's not showing. Yeah, and they come around and they destroy your your enemy. Mm-hmm. And Dave Filoni was such a fan of that style that he uses it in, I think, the Clone Wars movie. Yeah, I think he gives uh, Ahsoka the rights to that. Yeah, um, but Thrawn had it first. And so Thrawn is beating these uh, the New Republic, and it looks like the Imperial Remnant will take back over. And then right as things are going good, there's a character, flashback to one of your favorite alien species, he's a Nogri, mm-hmm. uh, and his name is Rook. And um, Rook finds out, or kind of comes to the conclusion, that the Empire has been kind of given his whole species, his whole people, the short end of the stick. Yeah. Well, and so his were... absolute loyalty shifts. Right, he was loyal to... Uh, Thrawn, because Thrawn had been handed leadership over the Nogri from Vader, who the whole Nogri swore allegiance to because they thought he was their savior. Um, and then that kind of shifts when Leia ends up on their planet and kind mm-hmm. of tells them the story straight. Mm-hmm. And they basically pass it along to Rook. And so, in the middle of a battle or something, I think he's in his art chamber, mm-hmm. which we didn't even mention that. Yeah. But one of the cool things about Thrawn is that he defeats his enemies by studying their art art forms from that species. And he and he's saying, basically uses that to get a psychological profile yep. and determines what their stratagem would be in any given situation. Exactly. One of his famous lines is, to defeat an enemy, you must know them. Mm-hmm. And so it's just one of those things where it's intellect over emotion. Mm-hmm. It's thought versus reaction. Yeah. And that's why he's the best. Uh, and so in the middle of his meditation, he's looking at art and stuff. Uh, Rook ends up stabbing Thrawn mm-hmm. and the, it's the coolest last the words coolest of, quote. Any, of any character in Star Wars he looks down and he, he sees that he's been betrayed and he's like it was so elegant or I think he says it was so artfully done yeah or something but like he that but he, even in his death he, he appreciates, appreciates it. That, yeah. how it was done um, and so uh, even after his death 
there's some kind of a clone of him that comes back or or uh yeah there was plans for it It never really comes to fruition yeah it's just a crazy thing and so anyways thrawn in in legends is for sure dead Mm -hmm. the beautiful thing about the new canon is that we don't know what's going on and so there is a ability for future thrawn stories you know thrawn's the kind of guy that he's for the greater good Mm -hmm. and he joins the empire because it's the greater good there's more order than there is but if the New Republic is taking over and things are going good, then I can see him joining the New Republic. Mm-hmm. Or especially after everything that happened with the First Order. I don't know how old he is and how I don't know what their life expectancy is with the Chiss. Um, but he's out there somewhere with Ezra. Mm-hmm. And will we see him in Mandalorian or whatever? I don't know. He's kind of a big enough character that if he came to Mandalorian, he could kind of steal the thunder. Mm-hmm. And I don't really see the benefit to Thrawn... Or to the show, really. ...working on... With the Mandalorian, there's nothing that's that great of an impact. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would love to see him on the big screen. Um, so it was really, really awesome. Uh, Thrawn, probably my... Both, it's always been my lifelong favorite character. Uh, so I just kind of have like loyalty to him from a, like, to a fault. I don't care. He's my favorite character. That's just the way it is. Um, I don't like... I love the Mandalorian, but I don't like that everybody's like, Yeah, Mandalorian would destroy Boba Fett. No, he wouldn't. Okay, chill the freak out. Uh, so all that to say, Boba is my favorite character. The more Kylo Ren comics and movies and stuff we get, I love Kylo. Uh, but there's something to be said for a character that has only been in books in a very small screen time. That's mm-hmm. not even on the big screen. That he's him and Kylo flirt back and for, back and forth between my number two and number three. And the fact that it's all book material or comic or like I said, minimal small screen time mm-hmm. there's a depth there and uh i remember reading i forgot to tell you this but i remember reading a thing where force awakens had just come out or maybe rise of skywalker or uh, last jedi had just come out and kylo's kind of in charge of the military at this point right mm-hmm. and the thron the new thron trilogy was ongoing and they asked him if kylo ren's first order and thron's imperial remnant met um who would win in a battle and Thrawn said, or Thrawn, Timothy Zahn said, uh, Kylo Ren is so ruled by his emotions, Thrawn feeds on that, he would have Kylo Ren for breakfast. And I thought that was freaking sick. I have trouble arguing with that. Kylo Ren is such a super powerful right. character. He would, be, he would be very easily manipulated, though. But Thrawn is just that guy that, you know, Kylo, he comes in, he has a freak out, and everybody just kind of, because of that freak out, they're like, whoa, what's going on with this? And Thrawn is the guy that doesn't care. Mm-hmm. Thrawn is the, you know, I'm a, I'm a UFC fan. Love Conor McGregor. Love the crap talk. But Thrawn is the Khabib uh, Nurmagomedov to, his, to Kylo's Conor McGregor. Because, you know, I'm not trying to turn this into a UFC podcast, but Conor was talking all this hot smack, and Khabib was just sitting there, calm, cool, and collected. And when the fight happens, you know, towards the end of round two or whatever, Khabib is just wailing on Conor McGregor, and he's whispering in his ear. Of course, there's microphones everywhere. You can't hear it live. But the next day, I'm watching recap, and Khabib's just, like, killing Conor, and he's whispering in his ear, let's talk now. Now we talk. Let's talk now. And he has Conor so nervous that at the end of the round, Conor goes, hey, man, it's just business. And I'm like, oh, my God. (laughs) He's got this dude, like... He's broken the the guy that mentally breaks everybody. And that's Thrawn. Thrawn is the guy that's he's just calm, cool, and collected. He's not going to jump out at you. He's going to let you make the first mistake, and then he's going to capitalize on it. Um, and then it's... I, I also wrote in our notes, if not for Rook's work and killing Thrawn, it's believed that Thrawn would have taken over the New Republic. Um, do you want to share this little factoid? Yeah. Uh, I've talked for like the whole time. I'm sorry. The way that Zahn... And- you know, just mad props again to him. He The way he writes his books, it really reminds me of Orson Scott Card, the guy who wrote the Ender's Game series. Um, his knowledge of theoretical physics and military strategy. like As a real individual, you can tell that he's very intelligent just because yeah. of what he's written. Um, but he said that if Thrawn, instead of Vader, had been in charge of the, the, fleet. the fleet or the organization or you know the plan, whatever you want to call it, around Endor in Jedi that the Empire would have won without a doubt. He says that if Thrawn instead of Vader was in charge of the Imperial Navy above Endor regardless of what happened with the Emperor Mm -hmm. that he said that the the Empire maybe never would have fallen. I mean that was the big catalyst. 
Um, so I just think this says so much about Thrawn. Um, so if you are a reader or you love audiobooks or even if you just want to look up stuff, hey, YouTube story for this, mm-hmm. uh, Outbound Flight is a singular book that Thrawn's in it. That's his first mention in the legends uh, as far as chronologically. Uh, the Heir to the Empire trilogy is Thrawn's first major appearance. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're a reader and if you, you know, for me, I like to have the physical copies of the book absolutely worth buying. You know, they're going to be less than the $10 on Amazon each. Uh, use that stimulus check for something other than buying a tiger. Uh, and go get that trilogy. And then uh, you have the Thrawn, the new Thrawn trilogy, mm-hmm. which, which is, is also phenomenal. Yeah, really great. Thrawn, Thrawn Alliance, Thrawn Alliances, Treason. and Thrawn Treason. Uh, all three really great books. Also, we've got a pre-sequel on the way. Coming in October... I can't remember, October 6th maybe, uh, Thrawn Ascendancy. And it's kind of his backstory of how he came to power within the Chiss Ascendancy, which I'm sure we will be all over that. Yeah, I look forward to it. Um, So we'll put a couple of links in the description to send you to whether YouTube or Amazon or whatever. Uh, Probably YouTube because you know how to Amazon, hopefully, if you're watching this. Uh, But we'll put some links in the description to uh, maybe some other YouTube channels that have, you know, synopsis of those books. Um... Uh, the guy Alex from Star Wars Explained does a really cool compare and contrast between the old Thrawn trilogy and the new Thrawn trilogy and the mm-hmm. highs and lows of both, so that's really neat. Um, but I know this was a little bit lengthier episode, but we've been dying to unpack this. So hope you guys enjoyed it. You have the time. We know you have the time, okay? And if you're a doctor or a nurse, God bless you. Uh, maybe watch this on your break. <laughs> Just listen to the audio-only version while you're taking a nap. Yeah, there you go. So, thank you guys for tuning in. This is the Chiss Ascendancy, signing off. May the Force be with you. And remember, the only family you have here is me. See you guys next time.